and that's how much you spend on the quarantine. Gee. Well, now that's how I approach the CERN problem. The the idea, if I was in charge, I would not do it until we got space, you know, accelerators that could do it safely on the moon or some other place. I mean, they already had a problem with the mag- magnets that broke off. And they, yeah, well, that's just a, that's just an engineering thing. Well, yeah, but they said they, the mistake was caused by their own mathematics. Yeah, so, well, I mean, here's my problem. That makes you wonder about the mathematics. Exactly. Right? Yes. Exactly. Well, there's two different sets. One is how to build something, and the other is what will happen when you smash these tiny microscopic things together. The reason that this is all so interesting is because this is the first time at these energies that they've been going to smack things into each other meeting head on. In other words, this is a colliding beam system where you fire particles going one way, and then you fire particles going another way, and you have the meat in the middle and go smash. And that's the most efficient high-energy way to do this, but it now brings us into the realm where we might, in fact, inadvertently create astrophysically interesting things, including a mini, 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 mini black hole. And, and this Professor Otto Rossler, the retired German chemist, says that we could expect major catastrophes, earthquakes, tsunamis that would occur at the points that they've emerged from the planet. I mean, well, if, if you wind up creating a, a mini black hole, it falls to the center of the Earth. By the way, there is one argument that someone on uh, one of the shows you did with the physicist who's really the most upset about this. Somebody that's called, Walter Wagner. Yeah, someone called in and said, "But Dr. Wagner." Um, there's no problem because, you know, objects, you know, microscopic atomic-sized particles have been zipping through the Earth from cosmic rays with much higher energies, and nothing like this has ever happened. And the difference, and this is an important thing for people to think about, the difference is that when you have a cosmic ray zipping through the Earth, it's moving in one direction, and the Earth is basically standing still compared to the speed of light these particles move at. Whereas with the CERN experiment, you basically are anti-colliding two beams directly into each other, like oncoming traffic. And what happens with the momentum then is it goes to zero, and the particles have no motion relative to the Earth, and they fall to the center of the Earth. Let's go back a little bit when they were experimenting with the atomic bomb, and their calculations showed that oh, there was yes. there was a remote possibility yes, that and beta and, they and blow up the atmosphere. Oppenheimer were on opposite sides. They were actually yep. taking bets if the nuclear weapon that they fired off here at, at Trinity in, in 45 in the summer on July 16th, a few miles south of me here, would actually ignite the nitrogen and the carbon in the atmosphere and cause a carbon-nitrogen explosion. explosion, which would have basically have incinerated the entire atmosphere of the Earth, and we would not be here talking about it if it had taken place. Would you, if you were working on that project, would you have told them, folks, we can't do this, we're not going to test this? See, this comes up against the hubris of scientists, which is second only to the hubris of doctors who consider themselves to be God. Mm. Um, Some. We, 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 we get to the point, remember what Oppenheimer said when the, when, the, when the weapon went off and did not destroy the Earth. You know, I had become death, destroyer of worlds, yes. quoting from the ancient Vedas. Exactly. And he, by the way, thought that the Vedas were an ancient piece of prehistorical history recording what the previous cycle of us nincompoops did in terms of developing these kinds of weapons of mass destruction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So given that we've gone through this before, according to certain scholars and, you know, Joseph's work and my work and some others like Graham and and Robert, is it not unexpected we'll do the same damn dumb things again and there will be a clan of people with incredible hubris who think they know exactly how the universe is put together and it's their arrogance of of the infallibility of their calculations, which is the scariest because... Well, in my gut level, I don't think anything's going to happen based on the reasoning that I've gone through in the last 20 minutes. I just have a feeling that it's wrong when a tiny, tiny, tiny group of people who are accountable to no one, no one, no one, abrogate to themselves the right to put all of humanity at risk. And this was like a six billion dollar project, something like that. Well, it's not the only thing they're going to be doing. You know, it's only this one particular experiment right. that, that runs the risk of, 
you know, producing these kinds of particles. There's lots of other things they can do that are perfectly safe and expensive but safe. It's mm-hmm. this particular experiment which is causing the problem because you're deliberately trying to create at the highest energies attainable on Earth at the moment, these particles that are supposed to be fleeting representatives of things that happen at the beginning of the current cycle of the universe, the so-called Big Bang. And you're at the edge of the unknown. When you're playing around with Mother Nature, Richard, something's bound to go wrong. Well, on this scale, I mean, we know that our super incredibly sophisticated intelligent ancestor did something really dumb, and they're no longer here. There's a whole bunch of ruins out there. There's nobody home, as far as I can tell. Yeah. That means that even very bright folks can do very dumb, stupid things. Maybe the Mayans knew that by 2012, a black hole would have eaten the planet from within. Well, see, now you get into an area that I, every time you mention this, I mean, at least you didn't mention asteroids tonight. Whatever the Mayans were talking to us about, and I think absolutely it was something really important, Uh it has to be cyclical. Yes. It has to be something that happens again and again and again. And the reason the Mayans figured it out is because they didn't figure it out. They had a source. They had text. They had records. They had, you know, an archive. They had a, a fragment of an ancient library. They had something that came to them from the gods, so they believed it absolutely. And then they reiterated it in their own language, in their own time, as the timing. I mean, look at how fanatically devoted they were to time. If you knew the universe, it's all everything you know is going to go through a wrenching, incredible major catastrophe periodically, wouldn't you be kind of paying really close attention to the time? Very close attention. So it makes sense that the entire Mayan ethos, the whole raison d'etre for the culture, lived to forecast when this would happen again and make preparations in whatever, you know, personal philosophical perspective that they had for the afterlife. If this thing ate the planet, would it continue eating things within the solar system, or would no, it just no, it would no, just it would, it would become a black hole orbiting where the Earth is? And what would happen to the moon? Get sucked uh, in? Depending upon the well, if it if it ate the mass of the Earth, which is all it could eat, then the mass of the Earth would remain exactly the same as the moon. So the moon would be orbiting this apparently empty spot in space. Amazing. So you just have a moon going or a loop to loop to loop to loop around the sun with with no primary, no Earth that it was orbiting. And what about the satellites? Would they still stay in the uh, geosynchronous orbit uh, around probably, nothing? Probably not, because eating a planet is not a is, 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 is not a spherically symmetrical thing. You'd have all kinds of weird distortions of gravity. Once it starts, would it happen quickly, or could this take hundreds of thousands of years? Oh, no, it would happen very quickly, because it's geometric. Remember the first Star Trek where Sulu talks about how the powers of this, this other guy, a member of the ship, who's been touched by this alien yeah. force, grows geometrically. It's like doubling your penny every day. Two pennies, four pennies, yes, you know, eight pennies, 16, that kind of thing. It's like the old rabbits. Yeah, so it's, so it's a geometric progression. So it starts out slow and ends very fast. And the period of time to eat the Earth would be on the order of months. What an incredible story. Stay with us. I think we'll open up the phone lines and we'll chat with Richard C. Hoagland, take a question or two from you as well. Final half hour with Richard C. Hoagland, EnterpriseMission.com, DarkMission.net, author of the book Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. We'll be back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Well, next hour we'll have sound off open lines for you. When we come back, we'll continue discussing things of all space things with Richard C. Hoagland. And also take your phone calls next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back. We're with uh, Richard C. Hoagland, final half hour with Richard C. And you, your phone calls as well. Richard, uh, anything new on Mars these days? (laughs) Kind of quiet lately by the the science boys. Well, um, we talked a couple weeks ago about uh, Dr. Chandra Wickrama Singh. Yes. Who is the uh, astrobiologist at Cardiff. University in England, who basically has come right out and said that NASA is lying to us about current life on Mars. And there are a lot of other things kind of moving in the dark that indicate that we may be on the threshold of some major announcement. 